morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome today on Amwal Mag uh, Nabil Nazir. He's the CEO of Al Suleiman Investment, which is a very well known single family office and the investment company of Dr. Hassan Ahmed Al Suleiman and uh, other shareholders of Al Suleiman Group, a very well known conglomerate in Saudi Arabia. Nabil is very well known in the Middle East as a veteran investor and also for his calmness and modesty. So, Nabil, Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Khaled. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'd like to start because business conditions have completely changed and have completely transformed. Uh, we are now in an era of uncertainty where COVID comes, goes, uh, little uh, of visibility on what is happening uh, globally. How have you adapted to this current situation? Okay, so... You know, now you said the word uncertainty, and I'll start with that, but, but it's interesting. Every year, when you think about it, there's been some sort of uncertainty. And, and I guess this year, maybe it's increased a bit, and, and the flavor of this year is, is COVID. Um, and I think the uncertainty it has posed on, on the financial markets is one thing, but on the other hand, the way it has made us change how we do business is a completely different dimension. So, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from the office, but it's one of the very few days that I'm actually coming to the office. Um, for most of the days, um, I'm actually working from home. Uh, and I think this has become uh, a very uh, normal practice to, to at least split your time between the, the office and home for, for a lot of people. Uh, when you work in investments, really, there is not much to do in the office except, you know, meet visitors. And these days, visitors are in, infrequent. Um, it's, it's all about managing investments uh, remotely. Uh, and that's over the phone, over the computer. And, you know, with, with uh, Zoom meetings such as this, uh, it really bridges the distance and allows uh, more frequent meetings without having, you know, that face-to-face -face contact. So really, I would say business has not changed or doing business has not changed much and it's uh, flowed pretty smoothly uh, since since the lockdown and and you know beyond i mean with what you're mentioning uh, people seem to have been able to conduct business and maintain business in a good way how about new businesses or new investment decision uh, is it more difficult or you feel it's it's uh, made it easier as well yeah, so, so look, when it comes to making investment decisions, um, it, it's, it's really face-to-face -face meetings were more about getting acquainted with, let's say, the fund manager uh, um, or potentially, if you're in private equity, with, with the potential uh, target company and, and so on. So for the bulk of investments, let's say investments, liquid investments, investments in funds, uh, especially well-known funds, I mean, not much has changed. Uh, the, the, you know, investing in them is, or meeting them face to face is more of a formality. So that can continue. The more well known the, the fund manager is, the less likely you need that face to face interaction. If they're introduced to you through your banker, or you know, they're onboarded on, on your private bank's platform, then you know you don't really need to dig and, and meet that person face to face. And Zoom meetings will, will do the job. Um, I think for those companies that are doing more uh, direct investments, who, who need to do more due diligence on the company rather than on, on a fund, I think maybe this is where things have stalled a little bit when, when you're unable to travel or, or have concerns about meeting face-to-face. -face. Uh, the, the, the way things have changed during this this pandemic is the we saw the rise of tech i mean we see uh, exactly as you mentioned the technology have been used more uh, vision 2040 had put a, a first uh, order for digitizing and uh, uh, making the saudi economy uh, tech friendly or pushing the tech how do you see in the current situation this moving forward in terms of investments and also the capacity to implement if the situation continues to last in terms of health risks? So, sure. Vision 2030 has gone through a lot of, uh, you know, changes since it first started. 
uh, just like any successful strategy, what you do is is you adapt along along the course. Uh, uh, you know, initially when when it was set up, there were targets for 2020, and then some of those targets were were met, and some were shifted towards uh, uh, further years, and some of the targets themselves were were adjusted. So so I think it's pretty normal for any strategy to to go through through changes throughout. And the important thing is you know to kind of have your north star. And, and stick to that direction. And I think this is what Saudi Arabia has, has been doing successfully. Um, you know, reducing the dependence on, on oil, uh, all these different infrastructure projects, uh, the mega cities and mega projects, these are all continuing. Now, do you have challenges? Yes, you've had challenges when oil prices dropped, obviously. You have challenges uh, uh, right now when, when you have lockdowns. I mean, when you had all these entertainment uh, activities that were supposed to attract a lot of international visitors. And then with the lockdown, you weren't able to do that. But then you kind of, uh, just like a startup, you, you, you pivot. Um, so, so the latest initiatives is, is kind of encouraging domestic tourism um, because there are no local restrictions. Uh, and then some of these projects are very long term uh, and really you continue along the same pace or along a fast fit pace because uh, it's not going to really, you know, everything's going to be okay, inshallah, in, 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 uh, by next year, let's say. So when you have a long term project, you're not going to stop things just because of a small dip in the timeline. So, so I genuinely believe that, that the strategy is going well and, and it's being implemented at the same vigor and same pace. When we continue our discussion on tech, we've seen a uh, supervaluation or overvaluation uh, on tech. We see today, for example, a few stocks, the FANGs, representing a large part of the value of the, the stock exchange in, in the US, uh, equivalent to um, a big chunk of all European stock exchange. And we've seen also, if we talk about the stock exchange, a heavy drop and a limitless uh, increase. How do you see uh, the, the valuation in, in general in all across asset class, let's say liquid like in, in, in stocks, but also in startups, in techs? How do you see it? And what is your general feeling? So, so I think when it comes to, let's say the US market, uh, I think the rally in, in the tech has taken most people by surprise. Uh, and, and I think the best, uh, the best description um, I, I read by one of the analysts, he called it the most hated rally in, in history, because I think a lot of investors, when we had that initial drop, um, they, they did not get the chance to buy at that bottom before the market started rallying. Uh, so so is, is it justified? In my opinion, no, it's not. Um, is everybody waiting for it to go down? Yes. Would it go down? Maybe it won't go down. Um, you're seeing in throughout history, this is the biggest time where you've had divergence between growth stocks and value stocks. Um, historically, that had led in, eventually to a convergence, which does mean a drop in, in, in the tech stocks. Uh, but then, you know, it's, it's a completely different uh, uh, playing field. So, so you don't know. Now, the question is, what do you do? Do you just, you know, wait for it to drop or do you sit on the sidelines if you can afford to? I mean, I guess family offices are, are better placed than, than, let's say, uh, uh, firms that manage third party funds in that you can afford to sit and wait. But at the same time, there are other strategies you can implement, not just having to sit and wait. Whether you're pessimistic or optimistic, there are always ways to, to kind of make money, um, I, either through buying or, or, or shorting or through structured products that might offer you, for example, capital protection, that might offer you even certain uh, uh, income streams if you believe the market is going to be stagnant. So whatever your view is, there is always a way to, to make money. So it really becomes irrelevant whether the market is going to continue to rally or not. It's about what your conviction is and what your risk tolerance is, and then you can act accordingly. Um, as you mentioned, most people today are working from home. Uh, large tech companies such as Microsoft, Google, are uh, giving the option or telling their employees that they can work from home. Do you see a risk on uh, commercial real estate and also 
retail real estate with the large uh, growth in uh, e-commerce and e-delivery, do you see a risk on these valuation and something that could grow into a, let's say, financial uh, crisis? So on, on retail, I think retail real estate has been out of favor for some time now, way before COVID, um, because of this uh, uh, shift in, in, you know, how retail centers function. Um, I mean, as, as retailers, we're, we're seeing a move to omni-channel, which by definition changes the purpose of your retail outlet. Uh, from a place to sell into something different, maybe a place to experiment or experience, uh, but not necessarily the selling point. Uh, so, so retail has fallen out of favor for some time. COVID has made that even worse. Uh, and, and I expect the trend to continue on, on retail real estate. On commercial, you are seeing uh, uh, different, you know, it depends whether people will return to the office or not. But when you see companies like uh, uh, Microsoft, like Tata Consultancy, which has 45,000 employees saying that working from home is going to become permanent, you have to think that maybe not everybody who's working from home now is going to you know, stay at home, but there is a portion that will do that. And that will make offices smaller. So I don't think the office will go away. It'll just become smaller. And that will mean several things. Number one, spaces uh, for, you know, for commercial properties will, big spaces will no longer be in demand, I think, or will be less in demand. And the second thing is how the office functions. It's whether it's location, uh, the way it is set up. Um, it's going to be more about shared working space uh, because you cannot have dedicated workspaces for everybody when, when you have half the you know, office uh, occupied. Uh, so, so really, I do think that uh, uh, office space or office real estate will be affected. We are cautious on that. It, ironically, I think it's more about finding, if you're an investor in office real estate, it, it's, it's uh, about finding the right tenant uh, rather than uh, having that mixed portfolio because you can have a general drop uh, but you're, if, if you have a very diversified portfolio, but if you have a tenant that's, you know, committed to that office, then you might be better off taking the risk of a single tenant than a multi-tenant office building. So I think it depends on your strategy, definitely depends on the location. Uh, I think yesterday I was reading an article about the departure of, of uh, you know, people from, from big central cities to go to, to more, uh, uh, you know, to the countryside, if you will. Uh, so really, it depends on, on the location of the city. It's very specific. But yes, generally, I think office will be affected. Commercial will be affected. Will it be a big hit? No, I don't think so. Uh, if you look geographically, which region uh, do you see having uh, being the most attractive uh, to new investments? And in, in I would say, do you see that uh, the, the distress factor will play uh, in the coming uh, six months or a year? So I think China and Asia um, are right now the hot geographies to be in. Um, they've weathered the, the, let's call it the second wave um, and the reopening after COVID better than any other region. Um, they, they present a great opportunity. I mean, you, you've got the sheer population. I mean, half the world is, is, uh, is over there in, in two countries, actually. Um, so so the, the size, the economics, the sheer growth that's happening, um, I would say China and, and Asia are definitely hot areas. Now, you mentioned something else, which is distress. If you're looking for distress, um, then you'll probably end up finding that in Europe and, and the U.S. Um, where, where, I mean, the U.S. Have had, has had very mixed numbers. You know, at times you see unemployment better than expected, and then you see consumer spending better than expected. So the resiliency of certain sectors um, will, if, if people who are waiting to, to buy distressed assets may not get as many chances as they think they will. Um, but definitely, if there are distressed assets to be, to be bought, it's going to be in the US and Europe. 
And um, so for, for you, where, which, which sectors do you think, uh, uh, let's say on a long-term basis, are the ones to be looking at closely? Which sectors would you be the most uh, interested in, as in investment uh, views? Okay, so, so first of all, as a, let, let's, let's split it. As a family office, uh, you have to be quite well diversified. You, want, you don't want to be dependent on, on uh, or overweight a particular uh, uh, you know, asset class or sector or geography beyond, uh, beyond you know, the, the normal, let's call it asset allocation mix. Uh, that being said, you do have some tactical plays that, that you would want to do. And, and again, it, it depends on whether you're talking about the liquid markets or, or uh, uh, venture capital and private equity. So, so in, the, in the capital markets, um, I, I think you, know, you have so many sectors there that are doing well that will continue to do well. I mean, tech will continue to do well. Uh, again, you cannot, you cannot just sit on the sidelines when, when, uh, uh, when the market is so overheated. You have to be invested, but you have to be protected at the same time. Um, in terms of venture capital, uh, I mean, it, it's, the, it's the same, I guess, sectors that everybody's focusing on. Uh, you're, you're talking about artificial intelligence, uh, 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 blockchain applications, uh, uh, machine learning, uh, health sciences, uh, so many things that you're seeing are, are the things that are now starting to have an inflection point. Uh, so, so these are the things that you really need to focus on on, on the long term. But, but in the short term, I mean, look, the logistics sector is, is a hot sector on, on actually multiple asset classes. It's a hot sector within, within the real estate asset class, within even listed companies, and, and uh, within uh, private equity. Uh, uh, so, so anything logistics related, uh, anything uh, omni-channel and e-commerce related is, is doing, doing quite well. Uh, telemedicine is, is another thing. So, so you're seeing all these themes that are, that are emerging out of COVID that are definitely worth investing in, um, not allocating significantly to, but having meaningful exposure to. Uh, uh, another theme has become much more relevant globally is the SDGs. And so there's been some discussions that uh, there's sort of a convergence between Sharia compliant investment and the SDG in the uh, uh, spirit of it and in the essence of it. Do, do you agree with this vision? So, so I think a lot of, uh, a lot of funds that are not Sharia compliant try to market themselves to Sharia compliant investors such as ourselves. Um, on the ESG uh, uh, kind of platform saying, look, there is a lot of relevance. We don't invest in, in the same sectors that, that are prohibited by Sharia. But that's only half the story when it comes to Sharia compliance, right? You've got the capital structure issue. You've got uh, uh, and the debt issue, obviously, the capital structure and anything derivatives related. So, so if you're, a, let's say, a a plain vanilla investor or, or, or fund for that matter, um, and you're only looking to, to buy certain you know, sectors, if you're what they call Sharia light, then yes, maybe ESG will, will do it for you because it's, it's more, let's say, it, it appears more in line with the spirit. But if you're, you know, if you're very, I don't want to use the word strict, but if you take the word Sharia compliance seriously, then, then no, you need to go beyond just the, the, the mission of ESG because there's more, more, at, uh, more at play there in, in what a Sharia compliant investment is. Uh, last question, uh, personal one. I, I've noticed among my, my contacts and my friends, a division between pro work from home and go back to the office. Where do you stand? Are you favorable of continuing work from home or looking forward to go back to the office and work from the office? So, so I think it's nice to have a mix of the two. Um, working from home uh, gives you, I mean, it's convenient, uh, it's relaxing, but you end up working more because you don't, there are no working hours. You, you're just working uh, across all hours. 
and and I'm reading a lot of articles about about the fatigue it's causing on on people because they're not realizing how much they're working and how hard they're working. Um, but at the same time, it's it's nice, especially if you have a big office with big in terms of the number of people you interact with. It's definitely nice to go and and socialize and engage. It's uh, it's not only good good for your for your kind of business network but it's also good from a social perspective i mean most of us our close friends are within our our business network so not going to work means seeing them less and less so so uh, uh yeah there, there's a certain you know we started the, this whole conversation by talking how do you do business from home yes business continues but it's not necessarily you know what you enjoy doing most as as an employee or as somebody who works in an office so so yeah there is there is something that i think a lot of people miss about going back to the office nabil thank you so much uh, for your time and for your insights on uh, the global and saudi investment uh, landscape um, and i wish you to stay safe thank you Khaled. my pleasure you too thank you